Okay, so for those who are new here, I don't think there is anybody brand new and shiny, but just in case there are people listening after this session has taken place um, and don't, don't, don't know too much about us, we're a new group, okay, and we're all about sharing knowledge and enthusiasm for British wildlife uh, and natural history. And we're run by the University of Salford, um, primarily for our staff and students, but by no means does it stop there. We're welcome to anybody um, who has these similar interests um, and just simply wants to get involved. Um, we hold these sessions uh, hopefully once a week. Um, so here's what we hope to pack into sort of around an hour uh, today. Um, so as you can see, there's there's quite a lot there. Um, just got some people adding joining the session. That's great. So, yep, so we've got quite a lot to pack in there, and we always have a guest talk. So today we have a guest talk from Dan Rouse, um, a wildlife presenter and ornithologist. So she's coming to us from rural Wales. Um, so with that in mind, as we often like to start off with knowing where everybody's uh, streaming from, hopefully you can see there a little we map of all the, the counties sort of in the UK and please feel free to make a mark on where you are streaming from today. Um, I would suggest the colour black um, to do it so if I roughly that's where, that's where I am if I do like a little arrow. Please feel free to make a mark on where you're coming from. I'm having a look to see if I can see yep some more people marking on so you can choose to do the zoom in section if you're sort of if we're all clustered around the university sort of within greater manchester and cheshire and so on then feel free to use a, a picture there to see where everybody's come from dan have you made your mark representing wales there excellent because we don't want this as i say to to just be for people at university of salford um, it's British wildlife, so the more people we have representing different areas of Britain, the more wildlife we can hopefully um, cover in this session. Okay, well, I'll move on from there. Okay, um, with every week we have a sort of what is it challenge. I did zoom in more than what that picture is. For some reason it's showing less of a cropping, <laughs> so it should be quite easy. So I'm not going to stay on it long. But if you can give me the species then just to make it a bit more difficult, um, I will at the end of this session um, reveal what species that is um, of an animal that's here and been seen very recently in the UK. So this is the part where we all chat now. So it's a very informal session about what people have been observing during lockdown. I know rules have been eased fairly recently, so we can all hopefully explore a bit beyond our doorsteps now in a sort of local way so please feel free now to either write in the chat box about what you've been seeing and i can read it out or if you want to raise your hand or even just go for it and then mute yourself um, there's not that many of us here if people want to share what they've been seeing um wildlife wise that would be great so does anybody want to uh put forward some cool wildlife that they may have seen um, so Steve's got no sound at present. Okay. So has anybody seen anything rather cool? I don't know about anybody else, but I've had around 50 starlings in my garden uh, this week, which is just incredible numbers. Um, and do keep an eye out for um, some special kinds of starlings as well. I won't give too much away. Um, there's a lot of cool birds about at the moment. Does anybody want to volunteer anything they've seen? So Luke says that he's seen a large heath butterfly as part of the Lanx Wildlife Trust reintroduction last week. That's super cool. Um, yeah, so there was a big reintroduction, um, a conservation intervention. Um, that's great if you're already seeing them. That's really cool. Did you see pictures at all, Luke, at all? Maybe you could share them next week. Yeah, I got quite a few uh, nice pictures, actually, of sort of the process of um, the Wildlife Trust in Chester Zoo. Um, reintroducing the species um last week yeah it's a it's it's an interesting butterfly to try and photograph because they're very small and very brown in a very big and very brown environment and mm -hmm. um they love landing on the ground in very thick grass so that makes it quite fun <laughs> yeah i mean uh, i mean we're gonna have a section um from dr jamie gundry in a short while about 
sort of tips on how to photograph. I know he specializes in invertebrates, which can be super tricky, but please feel free to um, send us some pictures and we can include them in next week's session. So Jamie, related to that, says he's seen lots of mating damselflies here in Chester um, and also four spotted chaser dragonfly. That's pretty cool. And Greg, wow, Greg's got Greg's busy. So night jars, super jealous. Night jars are absolutely amazing and we're getting less and less of them here in the UK because they have a very specific um, habitat preference. Um, so these big open clearings, which we don't often get anymore. Um, so night jars, cool. Pied fly catchers, wood warblers and wild boar in the forest of Dean. Um, so Greg is also doing a session in a short while where hopefully he maybe can tell us um, more about that. So Steve says the cinnabar butterfly in the garden the other day. Oh, that's really cool. Um, yeah, they're, they're super pretty. Um, so I'm liking uh, the, the, all the invertebrates going on. It's the rise of the creepy crawlies, I think, because um, I'm often very biased towards birds. So it's nice to see a red so Eleanor dragonfly, damselfly larvae as well in the pond. Yeah, so it's definitely the time for Odonata right now. Um, so your dragonflies and your damselflies as we sort of see the transition. Um, from spring to summer becomes, as I say, very much less about the birds now. And we sort of turn our focus um, towards the insects. Um, but that does bring birds as well. I mean, this is a great time for hobbies. Got to do a plug for hobbies um, because of all these things, insects flying around. Um, you often get the insectivorous uh, birds uh, being a lot more active um, as well. You might my, notice my sighting of the week was a little owl in um, a tree on a, a walk that I do uh, almost every day. Oh, uh, that's great. It was alert to it by making a noise. And then I looked up and, and saw it there. Oh, that's great. I guess you don't want to imitate that noise here on a recording, hey? <laughs> correct. Absolutely right. <laughs> okay, awesome. Well, you might notice on the slide that I've included here, um, there's a new Twitter page that's been set up um, by our school dean actually at Salford, Professor Sheila Pankhurst, and it's called um, Sea Wildlife News. So they're pretty much linked to us. And um, so for any of the Twitter users here, um, at the end of this, I'll tell you more about our Facebook page. But if you're more of a Twitter person, um, this is a really good uh, platform to use just to report your daily sightings um, as well. So I've just screenshotted um, the the Twitter handle there for you in the bio and a recent example from Sheila um, admiring some of the local wildlife in her garden. So uh, please be aware of that. So I'll move on just to try and keep to time. So we often have here at Sea Nature a video showcase um, just to sort of for any aspiring filmographers or anybody that loves sort of film um, and videoing um, what wildlife is doing on a local level. Um, and so what we have here is a link um, to a student's video, Hugh Nelson. So thank you so much for letting us um, provide this video. Uh, there are over 20,000 species of bee across the world. Found in every continent apart from Antarctica, they come in many shapes and sizes and are the best pollinators in the animal kingdom. This buff-tailed bumblebee is about to start a long day of foraging for pollen and nectar. While she will consume some of the nectar for herself, most of it will be brought back to the colony to feed other workers and the next brood of offspring. Before she's able to fly, she needs to raise her body temperature to 30 degrees Celsius. To do this, she uncouples her flight muscles from her wings and begins to shiver, raising her body temperature without moving her wings. The thick, furry hairs that cover her body help conserve the heat that she's managed to generate. And when she's up to the right temperature, she's able to take flight. Mm -hmm. 
Now this bumblebee is ready to compete with all the other bees in the garden to collect nectar and pollen to bring back to her colony. Great video there. Thanks for that, Hugh. And so every week um, we try and share videos that, that we as a group have made. So if you ever have any um, couple of minutes long uh, videos, then please feel free uh, to send them over to us. So each week we also do something called webcam of the week. Again, with the videography film, um, filming wildlife, uh, but not necessarily on our uh, doorstep, but uh, uh, on a much bigger scale, so often projects and things like that. Um, so again, if you ha know of any cool uh, camera, live camera footage that's going on right now in the UK of wildlife, do point it our way. So this was kindly provided um, by Philip. Thank you, Danny. This is a webcam of a colony of guillemots in Shetland. I find watching this uh, brings about peace, steadiness of the mind, something which we all need to do. I invite you to explore that, that calmness over the next 30 seconds or so. Hopefully everybody found that as much as a restorative experience as I do. Back to you, Danny. That was great. Thank you very much, Philip. Um, likewise, um, I think it's just so good for mental health as well and just overall well-being um, to be able to just take that time out and just be with nature, even if it's through a technological platform. Um, it still makes us feel close and engaged. Um, so, yes, thank you very much for that. Um, so we're now going to move on and I'm going to hand over to Dr. Jamie Gundry who's going to tell us a little bit more about his recent antics down by a local lake in Chester. Um, so over to you Jamie, I won't say much more on that. Okay, um, hello everyone. Um, so um, as well as being a teaching fellow at Salford, I do a lot of wildlife photography. So I challenged myself to see what I could get just with a smartphone and a little compact camera. Um, and I hadn't been to the site before. And frankly, it was wonderful for my happiness to discover it. I'd been meaning to check it out for ages. So I had to sort of park by a power station and toddle along a, a busy A road, try not to get run down. But I got there in the end and um, it was um, it's a wonderful, wonderful spot. Um, I was there again this morning and without sun, you don't really get many insects. So something learned there. Anyway, so um, it's really important to realise that for a lot of a lot of wildlife, you can get very good shots without expensive equipment. Um, and I, ha I had a wonderful time. I saw irises and orchids and buttercups, some families of coots, some passerine birds, um, several species of damselfly. They were mating all around me. Um, a four spotted chaser dragonfly I'd never seen before. Several species of beetle. They were also mating all around me and several species of butterfly. Um, I couldn't photograph all of these, but I had to go at some of them and I'm just going to show you the shots now. Um, so firstly, this is just a general view and it's always good for setting the scene and you probably can't see in this picture, but there, if I find the pointer, there were dragonfly damselflies mating just down here and I'll show you some close ups in a bit. So this is the yellow flag iris. 
very common. It's it's a weed almost on bodies of water. Um, there are ones on Chester Canal right now, but the ones at this lake seem just a little bit healthier. So big and showy, and obviously it's a plant, so it's quite easy to approach. Um, next, um, just some water plants really, they were backlit very well. And this reminds us that although the light may be best at dawn, it's perfectly fine at about at about nine or ten in the morning as well. So the sun is shining through the through the plants, kind of back towards the camera. Um, here we've got a northern marsh orchid, fairly common, um, beautiful, beautiful things. Um, no particular sign of insects pollinating it, but that's probably just a matter of time. And you can get these at Burton Mere RSPB reserve as well, um, although it is shut at the moment. But they're very abundant in a lot of, of Cheshire and Northern Wales and other sites as well. Um, On to the insects. I don't know what these beetles are, although they're very pretty. They're clearly having a lovely time. And this was a complete surprise. And, I, and this is taken on, on, on the cheap compact camera. Um, so it's good fun. Um, as always with macro photography, depth of field and getting the image sharp is, is difficult. So taking a burst of pictures is a good idea. Steve, are you able to tell us what uh, that insect was, that beetle was? It's a species of reed beetle, Chrysomelidae. Really? Okay, um, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Chrysomelidae, okay, thank you very much. Um, and next we have the damselflies. And now this is a male, as you can tell by the showy colour. And he was the only one that wasn't mating with a female. Um, I've no idea why there's this, if you look, there's a strand of silk there attaching him to the vegetation. I think he must have caught a spider's web or something like that. But um, again, this is taken on a very, uh, a very inexpensive camera about the size of a cigarette packet um, and turned out really, really well. Um, I don't know if you know if how many of you know what raw images are, but this is this is supported by raw. It supports raw images and fax, so do many smartphones. So you can really fine tune them and get the best out of the shots when you get back home on your computer. Next, we have um, some mating damselflies. They make this lovely heart shape and they were very, very relaxed. I, I got, I mean, I think this pair, I had an opportunity to photograph them with three different cameras before they finally left. That's the male at the top. And um, the, um, and after they've mated, he will hang on to her while she flies around trying to lay eggs because she won't let him, sorry, he won't let her go until he's laid the eggs. Because once he's laid the eggs, he knows that he, that he is the male that fertilized those eggs. So very, very beautiful. They're pretty relaxed. I was probably a foot from them, uh, probably less actually. And you can see that the camera picked them up quite nicely. Um, exactly the same behavior, um, but a very different angle. And you can see that the shadows of the wings come out really, really nicely. So these are probably about uh, a 60 centimeter, sorry, a 60 millimeter wingspan. So quite small, very beautiful, very common. Another common um, damselfly is the, is, the, is the common blue, but I didn't see any this day. And just to remind us that humans are not always considerate. And um, the last thing I photographed was a massive pile of rubbish. Um, and the damselflies were mating um, just on the left over here. So it would have been nice if someone had cleared that up, but they hadn't. I'll probably do it myself bit by bit. So I think that's all the pictures. Um, yeah. If anyone has a, uh, any questions about this, they can use the chat or they can email me at Salford um, and I'll return to Danny. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jamie. There were some incredible shots there. And what I really like about it is you didn't need the fanciest sort of SLR camera to do it. You can do it just um, from a smartphone or, or a, a small compact camera. So. Um, hopefully most of us um, would be in a position where we could go out and do the same and there were some great little pointers in there too so hopefully we can bug Jamie enough to, to provide these sort of each week and see what he gets up to and get some more tips um, but not that kind of tip like what we can see in that picture there is you know 
we're seeing it all over the country as much as it's great everybody's going out uh, we all need to be conscious if we bring things with us we should also take them home um, so yeah thanks for that Jamie so I'm going to hand it over um, to Greg hopefully he's with us I've seen him sort of coming in and out of the session um, so Greg did, delivered a really um, cool little session last week on moths because moths matter hashtag team moth um, so we're going to hand back to Greg again hopefully for more wildlife updates and I believe he's actually going to go beyond moths this time so Greg if you'd like to um, unmute your microphone and, and share your screen if you'd like to that would be great oh Greg says sorry having mic issues we'll try to reload okay no worries Greg um, I've actually not has anybody else been moth trapping uh, this week I know there's quite a, a few of us so while Greg sorts his mic out has anybody got any moth highlights themselves uh, my highlight was to get um, both the elephant and the lesser elephant hawk moth um, and on one day for the, the two poplar hawk moths two uh, male poplar hawk moths in in the trap in the same trap uh, those were the largest species that I managed to catch on one particular day. Yeah, <clears throat> Sorry, can you hear me now? We yeah. can, Greg. Hello. We'll hand Hi. over to you. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I'll, I'll try and share my screen. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, so as we've moved into June, it's become a much better site for moths. Um, and I've had a, quite a few new species already this week. Uh, possibly one of the most spectacular ones is this, which is the Scarlet Tiger. Um, this is a day flying moth uh, you get in the UK. I think it's quite lo localised, not everywhere gets them. But um, you often see this in your garden on a nectaring plant. Um, I've had about two or three. This is obviously when it's um, on the trap, it's got its wings closed. But I did get another picture just recently of um, last night, uh, in fact, um, of one with its wings open. You can see this fantastic array of colour. Um, there we go, there's the scarlet, and um, there was about two of them. They don't usually tend to end up in your trap, but um, they are um, they were all over it uh, last night, uh, about two of them, yeah. So I've already broken last year's record. Um, and this is another nice one, this is a, a gold spot. Um, and I don't think this, this picture does it quite justice because these two spots here are unbelievably shiny. It's like having two sort of panels of mirror in the wings. Um, I've never had them in the garden before, but they're quite quite a common species in the UK. Uh, lots of people in Gloucestershire have been catching them um, via Gloucestershire Moth Group. Um, and another one I've had is, uh, a couple I've had is a grey dagger. This is quite a common species in the summer. Uh, you'll get it a lot around the trap uh, or in the trap. Um, quite distinctive, quite a handsome looking moth actually I'd say um, and then uh, uh, shears again another common one like it's this one's not very well marked but they're these sort of two sort of blade like uh, appear, um, aberrations on the wing um, which make it quite a common moth I've had quite a few around the trap and I think they're quite a popular one around Gloucestershire um, in people's trap but I was much more impressed with this which is a member of the kitten moths um, and usually they're quite bright. This one wasn't particularly bright. It's a sallow kitten. And there's three in the UK. There's poplar, alder and sallow. And sallow is the, probably the smallest one and probably the dullest marked. Um, both the poplar and alder are also quite well spotted, but they've got a lot of yellow on these moths. Um, this one had only a sort of small hint. Um, you can probably see it better on the side, sort of along this, this border. There's a yellow on the head and along the wings. Um, and uh, had a lot of geometrids because it's been warm. Uh, geometrid moths have been very active. This is a clouded border, um, which looks quite yellowy, but they can be quite white. Um, quite a common moth again in Gloucestershire um, and all across the country. Um, and this is a peppered moth, which is obviously well known for its uh, being a key sign of sort of the change in the Industrial Revolution. Um, obviously, the black form became more common as the trees were covered in soot during industrial times. Um, uh, and this is a heart and club, which is a very common moth, but not as common as the heart and dart, which has been infesting my trap recently. I think I had about over 100 individuals about two nights ago when it was possibly uh, less than, didn't drop below 14 degrees. 
I think, which is perfect weather for moths. Um, high cloud cover, so the moon was uh, completely covered and it was very dark. Um, huge amount of heart and darts. Um, and also this, which is a silver Y. Now, I had to check this one because recently someone on Gloucestershire uh, Moth Group got a beautiful golden Y, which is a very striking looking moth. I could probably show it um, via Gloucestershire Moth. So if we go on the... I uh, had to go quite far back to find a, the name of a day flying moth. But, um, oh, there we go. Hold on, let's have a look. Yeah. Um, someone posted quite far back. But, ah, oh, this is it. Yeah, beautiful golden Y. So it's got these yeah. fantastic sort of colours and these sort of separated Y spot. Um, it's quite a common moth in the UK. Silver Ys are often uh, more associated with migration. Um, if anyone's aware of or knows their sport, there was quite a famous incident, I think Euro 2016 final, I believe, uh, when Ronaldo had a knee injury. There was this moth flying in his face and apparently it was a lot of silver wires that had landed yeah. on the pitch and rested uh, during the day and that they'd been disturbed by the football. Uh, this is another nice one. This is, this is the flame, uh, quite a sort of stick-like looking moth, perhaps... I don't know. I, I, when I first heard there was a moth called the flame, I expected maybe a little bit more of an orange striking one. Um, and then there's this one, which I only found out yesterday after being told by a member of a Gloucestershire moth group that this is actually quite a nationally scarce moth. Uh, it's called a cream border green pea, uh, which is quite a long name, uh, quite a small moth. It didn't end up in the trap, but I often go and check out during the middle of the night because often there is something that doesn't end up in the trap, but often will be on the wall or be new for the year. Um, and this is certainly one of them, a uh, nationally scarce species. Uh, Willow Beauty, I had to check the size of this one because there's also the Great Oak Beauty, which is similarly sized, um, but, well, no, sorry, similar looking, but much bigger, about two or three inches wingspan, while this is maybe just, just over half, one and a half inches. Um, and this is a straw dot, quite a well-known micro moth. Um, Again, it was, they're quite common. Uh, you'll probably see them around a lot. Um, uh, and uh, this is a clouded silver, which is quite a pretty geometric. Um, again, another really common one at this time of year. You'll probably get them around your, your moth trap or even just around lights outside your house. Um, quite a striking little moth. Uh, a wiband, uh, sorry, this is a riband wave, which has got its three, these three sort of spots stripes uh, along the uh, wings um, and these sort of two dark spots again another geometric um, species and this one was quite a, an enigma so this is actually called a lackey um, and usually they're quite sort of strikingly marked uh, or got quite a distinctive band but this one was very very dull looking so this is what they should look like you can see there's quite an obvious band um, but this one was very plain, um, so it, it took quite a while to work out what it was. It's in the sort of Egger moth family, which has got some quite strikingly large moths. Um, some of the really big ones will be out later on in the summer, um, or possibly even earlier, because I think a lot of the moths this year have been, been quite early. Um, and this is definitely one of the early ones. Uh, Pebble Prominent, this one. Um, another member of the prominent family there's quite a few that have been in my trap recently um i've been it's, this this one was new for the garden for me i had never had this one yet so i'd seen it on placement uh in my third year but this this is one that was new for the garden so that's quite a good find um and this one well this one's dark arches which uh unfortunately um once the heart and dart sort of invasion it has stopped this will over, uh, sort of take their place and dominate the moth trap through through to july late july early august when large yellow underwing will start replacing the dark arches um i'm expecting a lot of these to start showing up last year there was hundreds of individuals of these um and i think everyone else in gloucestershire uh also gets these but there's a few other moths that are out in gloucestershire at the moment that i'm not getting which are worth mentioning because they'll probably be out all over the country. Um, so this is a really striking one. This is buff arches, feeds on bramble. It's found in sort of gardens and stuff, and it's got these amazing 
patterns on the wings. Um, a wonderful looking moth, um, really striking. Um, if you're down sort of on the south coast, you might even get the uh, very, very striking cream spot tiger, which someone in Gloucestershire had this week. This is a very rare one in the county. We don't really get it here because they like sort of coastal areas. So um, I've seen them down in Kent, Dorset, sort of south coast areas um, and a really, really cracking looking moth. Um, uh, another one I found recently, if I can go down quite far, this is it. Yeah, peach blossom, fantastic looking moth, um, quite pinkish. This isn't a great photo of it, but if I sort of look it up on the internet, um, there we go. Um, you'll see it's got these wonderful sort of pink spots and colours all over. Um, it's quite a common one in the UK. You probably get, I think you get them as far up north. Um, definitely sort of one of the ones that that moth people try to use to sell to sort of people that are wanting to learn more about moths because it sort of break the mold of uh that moths are all just boring sort of brown things that just fly around lights or your face um yeah um so i've had a few other sightings and trips recently uh i took a trip at my local hill and the common spotted orchids are beginning to uh uh show themselves uh emerge I think with all this rain we've had over the past two days, hopefully they'll sort of kick into gear. Um, and also chalk fragrant orchid, which smells of honey. Uh, very sort of strong scent. Um, and they're all over the hill at the moment. Um, lovely, lovely uh, orchid. Um, this is a lace border, which is a day flying moth. Quite common, um, but difficult to photo because as soon as you get near them or make a slight sort of crackle in the dry vegetation they're off uh, somewhere else and I think this is a budding pyramidal orchid uh, just at the very start of its emergence um, hopefully in about two weeks it'll be a fantastic sort of pyramid shape um, and all over the hill uh, I could only find one yesterday but there should be hundreds out eventually um, and a lot of little butterflies and my first bee orchid as well uh, which was at a quarry uh, site in the south of Gloucestershire um, should be finding some more and hopefully fly orchid as well but yet to see those yet um, and this is the marsh fritillary uh, quite a rare butterfly um, sort of uh, continentally even in Europe um, this is the only site in Gloucestershire where you can find them lovely sort of striking butterfly with these sort of checkered wings um, and the Adonis blue which is our brightest blue butterfly species and it's re just restricted to sort of calcareous grassland within the south of the UK. If you get a chance to see these um, on the wing, they're fantastic. They're wonderful sort of bright blue, uh, um, electric blue, um, common blues, which are quite similar. They can be quite blue when you look at them, but when you compare them to Adonis, uh, you can instantly see the, dif the difference. Um, it's, it's an unbelievable blue. It's, it's incredibly catches your eye almost immediately. Um, I also took a trip to the forest where there's a small pearl bordered fritillary, the only site in Gloucestershire for them, which uh, feed on a type of violet. Um, I had a good good few numbers of them um, the other day. And whilst I was out in the forest, I came across, well, I was walking into the woods. Um, I had to zoom in a lot. I've got a Nikon P900 camera, which has got a massive zoom of about 83 times something. So I was actually quite dis distance from this nest because I didn't want to disturb these but this is a pie fly catcher um, and I saw the male and female uh, the other day so I've got a short video of them that's the male leaving and there's the female darting quickly in um, I'm not able to share my sound but if I would you'd hear the very distinctive call of a wood warbler as well in the background um, and uh, actually talk about hobbies as we were earlier I did have one just the other day Grip me off with a hobby photo now. <laughs> uh, oh no, it's it's not very good at all. It, it's it's a it's a distant one, but you can you can tell it's a hobby at least. There we go. Um, here it is. So it this is trousers. a hobby. The yeah. red trousers, yeah. Um, got the red trousers. Oh. At my placement uh, at the moment, we've had a uh, or well, my placement down in Kent, which was like for third year. We had uh, we've got a number of these, um, but also they've had a lot of red-footed falcon recently they've had a male and a female down there and i think something like 200 
kites flying over so there's quite a lot of raptor migration going on at the moment um i've got a video of the hobby hawking as you can see they incredibly quick incredibly hard to uh and it was constantly doing these amazing dives catching all sorts of flies and insects around um so it vanishes and it sort of vanished here i think um i've also got red starts up on my local patch um singing quite passionately from the hawthorn bushes still i'm expecting mm -hmm. them to go quite quiet soon um i'm still getting a few cookies as well which again i expect to be pretty quiet um within the next few days oh. when i collect the moth trap in the morning um i can still hear one on the hill uh and i had a scarce i think this is a scarce chaser uh along a stream and also banded dim as well steve here to confirm if is it definitely it's that scarce chaser i think so yes yeah um wasn't sure how that, that <laughs> i tried to identify it but i think i could be wrong really yeah. <laughs> yeah oh and another bird i had which i was quite excited for because I, I haven't really had a good view of one is a yellow wagtail which is um a declining sub-saharan migrant um mm. that is a uh, well its favorite habitat sort of damp flooded meadows with cattle where it will feed along with them and um this is a bird that really has been hit hard by the changes in agriculture it's one of those farm and bird species along with turtle dove corn bunting yellowhammer and skylark which is considered under threat um but yeah i went to a good site with damp meadows and this male was showing himself really well amongst the sort of flooded flooded grass um and also i had a hedgehog in the garden when i was checking my moth trap um I had a very strange sort of rapid breathing noise and just realized i was oh, I'm almost about to stand on a um hedgehog when i was trying to get to the moth trap so that's quite interesting um i oh, often hear things <laughs> yeah yeah lucky <laughs> yeah I've, I've been quite lucky um hopefully tomorrow i'm going to see um quite a rare orchid as well i'm going to a site which has got a uh, burnt tip orchid um which as you can see is this fantastic but quite small looking flower i think they're about to go in but hopefully uh tomorrow i'll have some success finding them and i think that's probably everything major i've seen no, oh and a brown argus i was gonna say maybe make it your challenge to uh present as burnt tip orchid photos next week yeah hopefully i've, I've got the site i've got the gps site location for it someone gave it to me so if they're not there then the rabbits have got them first um, yeah. yeah i think i can speak for everyone that, that was great there was so much wildlife to see there um yeah that was really really great uh yeah i'm just excited for your next session um yeah. but i might i might move on now if that's okay that's um, absolutely fine that was that was so so good so thank you so much greg um so i'll just pop our thing back on Okay. Just letting it load up. It's not the fastest. There we go. Excellent. So I'm now going to hand over to this week's guest speaker. So obviously I'm horrendously biased because she's a personal friend of mine, but she really is um, a great role model for any of our students that are doing biology, wildlife, or just generally want to get um, into careers to do with nature, um, particularly here in Britain. Um, she's given lots of talks at numerous sort of wildlife and conservation events. So we're very lucky to have her today. Um, so I'm not gonna say much more. I'm just gonna hand over to you, Dan, if that's okay. If you want to just load up and share your screen. Yeah, I'll just share it up now. So yeah, so my name's Dan Rouse. Um, don't really know what to say about me. <laughs> what I'm doing. I normally have <laughs> someone write something. <laughs> but yeah, my name's Dan Rouse. Um, I'm a TV presenter for S4C, and I'm on Springwatch, Coast and Country, and all that jazz. But 
basically my regular life, I'm an aviculturist. So I've worked with some of the world's rarest birds. So I'll just give a brief thing to an introduction to aviculture and what it is if you wanted to go down that sort of career path. So aviculture is a bit of a forgotten art type thing. So most people, when they go to do zookeeper and everyone wants to work with the bigger animals as opposed to the birds, whereas the birds are really complex to work with. So the purpose of aviculture is to provide expert advice. So there's different things you learn, but basically aviculture comes with experience. So a lot of it you can read from books. I think there's only two books available on aviculture. So it's not that much of a chore to read. They are fairly small. But birds have got very, very strict regulations. So if you have a rare bird, like um, the ones I've worked with, that one is a red-breasted goose. If they're on the critically endangered list, the endangered list, or even the vulnerable list, you need a stud book. And that basically means that all males are controlled to what partner and what institute, because they're so valuable. Something like um, the bear's potchards that I've got in my centre, our male will be sent to another centre if that centre has got enough facilities, the, good, um, the facilities are good enough, they know what they're doing with that species, so they're not just given to anyone. You've got to really sort of look at who's getting them because they are so valuable, not only in terms of money, but also in terms of if we lose one, we've almost sort of lost a third of our breeding population, especially for things like spoonbills and pipers that I've worked with. But perks of the job, you do get to see a lot of cute baby birds. So these species require certain care. Um, this one we're doing a flamingo check. So flamingos have to be checked every three years. They've got to have tissue on their leg monitored. All flamingos are microchip as part of EU rules and will be part of K rules as well. You've got to check the coloration of the eye, coloration on the face. Yeah, if anyone has any questions in the chat and I'll ask them as I'm going. Flamingo, um, it might look odd what I'm basically doing, I have one on the right. So my hand, so that's flamingos, I've only got about two or three layers of tissue on the legs, so if the knees not together at all, they can either dislocate their legs or they will start bleeding heavily. So you've almost got to sort of Spider-Man Wolverine in between the legs to stop them from touching. But yeah, flamingos are very difficult. They're, as everyone loves them, but for me, they're probably the worst bird I've worked with, um, along with the cranes. They're both awful birds to work with. Um, yeah, enclosures can be sort of created based off of what species you want to put in there. So not all species work together. Soon you can sort of manipulate the ratios to have a nice collection of them, but more females to males. Other ones you can only have maybe one other species. Other ones they don't get along, makes you a life an absolute misery if some of your birds don't get along. You've got to spend hours babying. We had a particular goose, um, it was Kate Barron, so Stereopolis goose. They're known as piggies, they sort of make like a pig noise, but he was an absolute pain to deal with. He would just, on any child in a pram, he had to pull off blankets off all the children. And we've got about a thousand visitors a day. Your life is just misery when you've got this bird to deal So we do have a thing, most centres have it. We have an offshore area. We called ours Goose Jail. So every time he ended up, he got put in Goose Jail to think about what he was doing before putting it back. But yeah, a lot of sectors, there's a few particular zoos in the UK that I'm not a particular fan of. And that is, a lot of them put the size of their enclosure and cram it full of birds. Whereas birds need to have space to have their own area, so they need their own pockets. If someone's having a domestic with their partner, they can go opposite ends and you've got no sort of any backlash of you. They can have 
if you've got swans in particular, you need to give us because when they get very aggressive, they can be quite intimidating, especially on children. So there's two zoos that just show the birds they like into one enclosure because they think it looks nicer, whereas they end up with people like me visiting, doing the checks and a lot of stress and injuries there. Um, so yeah, you basically to be, I'm sorry, I'm ranting. <laughs> so what you basically need um, for aviators a basic understanding of birds. It doesn't have to be your identification skills. Um, a lot of these birds I've with are exotic because they are on the critically endangered list. We're quite fortunate that some of those we've worked with um, in Britain aren't on the critically endangered list, so they don't really need in situ sort of taking of eggs, incubating, putting out. Um, you probably have noticed some of the birds I've worked with are wildfowl, so I'm part of the goose specialist and duck specialist group. There's only a bunch of us on there, and it means we comment on what a lot of people are doing. Um, so this one, you have to be willing to put birds first. So if you've got aviculture and you're in a team meeting and someone says they want extra money and someone agrees to take money off you, then you do have to stick up for your birds. You're almost their parent. So anything that happens to your kids in the zoo or in the wildlife park, whatever it is, then you have to be willing to put your birds first. Um, perks of working around wildfowl, you need to be practically waterproof. So most of my day is changing twice or three times a day in the water maybe five times because certain birds will try and pull you into the water not in a scary way the little ones the little baby like to play so if you're working in the duckery they sort of try to pull you into the water so you play with them um and obviously we're in wales so it does rain a lot and then um other birds will flap water at you because they don't like you for a particular reason there's a pair of black neck swans that don't like me at all i haven't done anything to them other than they eat out of the bucket as opposed to eating from their bucket and since that day they've not liked me but chuck water at me every time i walk into that enclosure um the biggest thing about aviculture you need to have a willingness of being critiqued so there's different EU regulations, there's different UK regulations, there's personal regulations. Um, you can make EU standards, but you may not cater to everyone's taste, which is the thing of a lot of zoos. But it's other people are more again. So if someone's been in the job 30 years, they probably worked with a lot more species than you have. Likewise, if you're on with, like for me, with spoonbill and pipers, you know the ins and out of breeding that cheese and the conservation and visiting them and everything to do with them because you have done your research are there when you've got some a bit more experience who haven't worked with that but you have to communicate and bounce off each other and that kind of thing so this is basically the viewer impress stage one which is the swan you have to actually find your nests and when you get nests, depending on what bird it is, sometimes it's easier than others. Swans are great at it, they tend to say and show you where their nest is. Something like Makoa duck, which is a tiny African duck, um, they will tell you where the nest is. But they will let you know once you get into it. It's probably the only bird that I've had numerous cuts off and actually have to wear wellies in 30 degree heat under polytunnels because they just rip your ankles to pieces they're all like the jackals of the wildfowl world so yeah once you find a nest you need to then look at your eggs depending what's in that enclosure as well you need to check your eggs measure your eggs um because you parasitic ducks so this cluster of eggs here the top right one, I'm not sure if you can see my arrow on the screen, the top right one is of a black-headed duck. It doesn't belong in this nest. So these are all freckled duck eggs from Australia. And there's a black-headed duck egg. So they are a parasite uh, or a parasitic duck. So yeah, you do have to be careful with what eggs you're doing and checking them all. And when that, 
to the incubator and then you check them maybe twice a day, make sure your incubator is working, temperatures right then, depending on what the climate is in the room, the humidity is right, and that rotation is actually turning. Uh, what I do is I'll write down what species and also the date I collected the egg. And then that makes it easier to monitor whether it's there due for hatching or was later hatching and it might need to be hand hatched. So this is that a hatching stage. So like I said about hatching, which is number one, this is a harlequin duck. I know Danny is particularly fond of Halloween harlequins. So stage one would be they would hatch out onto a hatching grid. And that means there's no vibrations, there's no movements at all. So the bird uses its own time, energy, own body and ability to climb out of the egg. But with this particular bird, climbed out fine. Number two didn't move, so it cut the air hole, so it was pierced air sac, but it didn't climb out, which means that you've got to go in and check every hour. If it hasn't moved the hours, you have to um, open the top and try and you can't just like a jam up or so plop the bird out. You've got to almost scoop them out without peeling anything around it because it's still feeding off food sack within the egg. So it's quite difficult. It's not something I'm particularly fond of doing. I've had to do it to two birds. Most of them are fine. Normally a bird where mum's new and she doesn't incubate them correctly that they get stuck on one side than two. So with wildfowl and blur, you leave them with mum for about 10 days. So once they get the stage one of the hatching process, that's when you take the eggs off mum. So they've got that parent relationship. So when it comes to putting the ducklings from the duckery back with mum, she'll sort of know which offspring are hers. So they're a bit more accepting. Otherwise, like I said, it makes your life a misery when birds don't get on. Stage two is this little bundle of fluff. Harlequin ducks are particularly fluffy and particularly adorable looking. And then after about two weeks, they grow old enough so that they need to go into a different tank. So harlequin ducks, because they're sea diving birds, we actually have about a metre, metre and a half deep tank. So they get fed on the edge, but we also have a feeder under the water so that we're forcing them to use the ability of diving lungs and their dive ability with their beaks is still there. Um, other birds we will just pop them inside and they will be reared in different ways. So the basic steps. So typically sea diving set is one that my team invented. Um, that particular it doesn't look fancy at all. But particular one sea diving ducks are very, very difficult to rear. Um, I think the success rate is maybe 20% to get them to that juvenile stage. It's really poor because in Britain we don't know what to do. We've only in the last 10 years started rearing or keeping sea diving ducks. So we don't really know what to do yet. But it is our almost invention. So you've got a very, very deep side on the right. And then you've got a map with a ramp. So they climb up, and then you have a jam jar with food. So don't give them just a drink because we want them to drink as they're diving, which is what they would naturally do. A wet up is for birds that like to swim a lot, but aren't considered sea diving ducks. A wet setup would be things like white headed ducks, ruddy ducks, macoas. They typically live on um, UK wise with like tufted ducks. They particularly um, live on things like lakes and rivers, but not at sea where they need almost to use different abilities. And a dried up is for your regular sort of aspers, mallards. We don't have mallards, but things like mallard, gadwall. They're not fancy at all. They're quite happy to take over. So every one of these have a heat lamp on them. And then you can actually reduce the heat and force them to use their own abilities and regulate their own temperatures by huddling together or moving apart. So you need to almost play mum to them. 
Um, it might look odd, but we do put marbles in the water dishes because ducks are only waterproof if mum rubs her waterproofing from her gland onto the duckling. If she doesn't, they're not waterproof. And ducklings have a fondness for sitting in a water dish. So the easiest way is to put marbles in it so it forces them not to sit in it, but instead they can get their beaks into it. And then we've got advanced setups. So these are trial and tested ones. So African um, white black ducks or black ducks, depending on what general term people use for them. They are horrible to deal with. They hiss at you the minute they hatch, they hiss at you, they run at you, and they try to pull chunks off your fingers. And that is about two hours old. They're lovely, they're cute, but in process of them is one I tend to give to the interns because you've got in this one you need to have running water you can't have water stagnant they need running water they need food at a lower level to where they sleep otherwise they won't eat it um and then the second one is a freckle duck setup so a freckle duck setup the food dish which is the one that's just solid food that needs to be exactly two inches from its water dish which is the one behind the wire and it's got to be exactly two centimeters from a water dish you need to be able to do that otherwise it won't eat um muslin ducks again they're very stagnant foods so we just put um the, the big microwave ones we tend to put under there just for them to keep their feet wet. But yeah, most of my life I've been working, training pelicans, training geese, and herding geese. So agriculture is a sort of it's a special craft. Depends on if you really love geese and you want to conserve them, you can have to go down the ecology route, and that is to them in the wild. Or you can go down the aviculture route and monitor them and breed them. So it depends on what one you want to do. So aviculture is in zoos, but it's also, you have, we've, uh, WWT is an institute up in Russia that breeds them out there. It's two different options, but it's all aviculture. So if anyone wants to talk more aviculture, if anyone has any questions at all about aviculture or how to get into it or want some advice or contacts or links for internships, feel free to ask Danny for my email and she'll pass any questions on to me and I'll provide you with as much internships or links to anything All right, thank you. But that is all me. I'll do better than Annie. Cool, I think I lost you a bit. It went a bit crackly there, sorry to interrupt. Um, but yeah, no, that was great. Thank you so much, Dan. Um, so a little insight into aviculture there. Um, as Dan said at the beginning, when everyone thinks about zoos, they don't necessarily think about aviculture. Um, being its own things so that was really insightful and yep yeah, I'm happy to pass on Dan's details to anybody um, that wants to get in touch um, relating to that talk or general sort of career stuff so just two more things um, to do to then bring the session to the end so I'm now going to hand over to another guest um, who we're quite familiar with now which is Steve um, 30 days wild wildlife trusts um... For a long time, we just spent our time acquiring nature reserves and conserving wildlife. But one of the things that we realized was that if you don't connect wildlife to people, and if people don't care about wildlife and don't know about wildlife, then why would they want to support you in preserving it? So we put a lot of effort these days into connecting people with wildlife. And this is our flagship campaign every year. Through June, just started, People sign up and pledge to do something wild every day for 30 days. And it can be anything from just laying on your lawn and enjoying the bird song. It can be going for a walk on a mountain. It can be photographing some flowers, watching a butterfly, just about anything. And people quite often, they record these things. They go on social media to post stuff about it. And uh, we have this crazy period through June where everybody gets hooked up. And this year, and we have so far had 127,000 sign-ups, which is astonishing. Last year was our record, and we had 79,000 last year. 
And just to give you some statistics on this, I mean, these are these are stats. We do a bit of analysis on it. So last year we had 79,000 people, but they, some of these signed up as businesses and families and schools. So it actually equated to around 388,000 individuals taking part, which is it's mind blowing. Uh, and the, the amazing thing for us is 86% of these people aren't members of the trust. So this is reaching way beyond our membership out into the into the um, the wider communities. So it's such powerful stuff for us. To, um, you can see all the other statistics there. And on the right here, you can see that how it's grown from, it's only started in 2015, uh, 12 and a half thousand signups. And now we're up to 120. Obviously it's a bit different this year. People are maybe looking for things to do, but it's still fantastic. We hope they come back next year. And if people are interested, we also have this, um, we, we don't just do it, we actually analyze it. And the University of Derby did some work looking at the positive health impacts of being involved in this. And it showed not just a direct positive health impact while people were participating, but it showed a couple of months later in follow-ups, people were still seeing and feeling the benefits. Um, if people want to, um, if people want to uh, see this actual report, I can post a link to it. I'll, I'll uh, copy that in at the end. Um, I think that's it really. It's it, it's become an incredible participation event every year. There's nothing else like it. It's not like the big butterfly camp or the big bird watch um, that RSPB do because those are very focused on one specific. This is about just getting out and enjoying wildlife and it goes on for a month. And uh, well, it's one of the best ideas we ever had and it's one of the most successful. Okay, I think that's that's yeah it's that's great thank you very much steve if you could kindly stop, stop sharing, sharing. Yeah. there we go mm -hmm. uh, so mm -hmm. just this one. excellent so with our final section of today's session that you should have been here yesterday um this is arguably one of my favorite bits of the c nature um magazine agenda. Um, it's where Professor Rob Young fills us in on some maybe perhaps cool and interesting things we might have missed online. So am I okay to hand over to you there, Rob? Yes, thanks, Danny. So um, as some of you probably know, I spend my time between other things looking for resources to lighten people's lives in this moment. And one of the things I found was this uh, relax to the sounds of British wildlife which I often now use as a soundtrack when I'm working, especially on a colder day like today, when I can't have the windows open because I have a Brazilian wife who will complain that it's very cold. Um, so I can't listen to natural bird sounds, but at least I can listen that way. And as we all know, listening to wildlife sounds is very good for our well-being and our concentration. So I just thought I'd share that resource because there's a lot of these resources out there that people could use um, to connect with nature when they're at home. Then the other thing that really caught my eye was a news story about white stork chicks, the first hatching in the UK in 600 years. And I think forget that there was lots and lots of wonderful wildlife that was, you know, driven to extinction by um, in the recent, relatively recent past. And now there's a number of organizations such as the White Stork Project, which are endeavoring to bring these species back. And so I think it's really fantastic, you know, that we've now got white stork chicks in West Sussex and they're planning to bring back, uh, trying to in reintroduce at least 50 pairs. So hopefully we'll get a stable population um, in the future here in the UK. I really look forward to seeing other um, species being reintroduced here in the UK. So it's nice to have a positive story. And then finally, um, couple of things one is um, there's a lot of citizen science apps we've got lots of bees in our garden I realize I actually know very little about bees and so I found this spot a bee app which is actually um, set up by the University of Glasgow and the University of Cardiff it's helping to map the bee population in the UK and with your phone you can download it onto an iPhone or you can download it onto an Android phone you can take photographs of a bee and then you can upload them 
and it will geolocate those photos and they will do the identification of the species and so we can start looking at what's going on with the bee populations here in the UK and as I'm sure you're all aware there is you know great concern globally about what's going on with bee populations uh, around the world so this is a nice way that we you know when we're having a break we can get involved and do something meaningful um, with our kind of you know lunch break or whatever we're doing during the day and the final thing very important especially um, with current world trends is what's been trending on Twitter black in nature black birders week on Twitter and so now there's a big movement to recognize you know the diversity of people involved in doing studies in wild and participation in wildlife and I think this is you know something that's very important to recognize as well that you know it's an inclusive activity and everybody can benefit from it and should benefit from it and I think that's that excellent thank you so much Rob and yeah just to reiterate um, do check out um, the Black AF in STEM group um, they're doing a whole range of events that started just a couple of days ago so there's still a few more days left to get involved whether it's sort of tweeting out questions to do with nature in which um, black birders black scientists um, are able to respond and engage directly with you and just sort of brainstorming ways to sort of address um, some of the issues that have been coming up uh, this week that have been particularly highlighted um, by recent movements as well um, so yeah so just to bring it to a close you may remember over an hour ago I challenged you with the not so challenging uh, cropped picture here um, does anybody know what this is so feel free to write it in the chat area or shout it out Grass snake. Yeah. it is I know my crop actually originally was much more challenging it was just cropped in on the mouth but for whatever reason it obviously gave you guys an easier time um, today um, so grass snake yep exactly not venomous um, obviously wouldn't want to be bitten by one um, but quite common sightings at this time of the year um, they're also quite territorial so if you do see one chances are you can go back and revisit it again but I would recommend you keep a distance as with all wildlife to sort of respect them for what they are so I'm going to bring it to a close. So as I say, yep, yeah, sorry, grass snake there, recent split um, from Natrix Natrix. Um, so it's definitely its own species. Um, we're tentatively scheduled to run again next Thursday. OK, so I just want to thank people. I'm not sure why the text has gone super tiny there. Um, but I would definitely like to thank our staff, so Dr. Jamie Gundry and Professor Rob Young, uh, for their contributions, um, in addition to Hugh Nelson and Gregory Lee as well. And then a big thank you to our external guests and speakers, so in particular Steve Garland and, of course, Dan Rouse as well. Um, just to make you aware, as a last slide here, we do now have um, a Facebook group. Again, I'm not sure why the text has gone dead small here um because it certainly isn't in the in the actual presentation but we do now have the makings the starting of a facebook group see nature um so please do check it out um, we're keen to grow numbers over the coming weeks and and it's also there that you can find recordings of these sessions so i'm just going to end it there now so philip can stop the recording thank you very much